So today we're going to run through combat and movement rules for Spelljammer 5e, or at least what we use. Our rules are similar to that of the original Spelljammer. We purchased the War Captain's Companion on Drive-Thru RPG. It was like 20 bucks. What Wizards recommends doing is buying Ghosts of Saltmarsh, the new 5e module, and using the ship-to-ship -ship combat rules in there. I think that's a terrible idea. We're going to show you what we do. So I've created a spreadsheet that anybody can use. It's got all the ships from the Astral Adventures Guide converted from the original Spelljammer. The only one that's not in the original Spelljammer, of course, is the Living Ship, which is what we use. I did derive some stats for it. They're included in the spreadsheet. We're going to go over that spreadsheet in a moment. Additionally, the link to it will be included in the comment section below. As I said, the system that we use is largely based on the original Spelljammer. In that system, the two most important components are your SR rating, which is essentially your movement, and maneuverability class. So for movement, the one thing that is new to the new Spelljammer ship stats that was not in the original is a speed. Now what we did is we went ahead and used that as a max speed, but we used the standard SR ratings. So to calculate SR, which is in a straight line in combat, the number of spaces you could move forward on a hex map, the original Spelljammer had a table with the wizard level and you had a flat SR level based on the level of the wizard piloting the Spelljammer helm. And of course, whether it was a minor or major helm. So what we've done instead is to calculate your SR rating, the way that we do it, is we take a base based on the Spelljammer Helm, so one for a minor, three for a major. We add the wizard's proficiency. So for example, levels one through four is a proficiency of two. So if you had a minor Spelljammer Helm, that's one plus two, which is three. And then you roll a d20. When you roll a d20, you do get to use spell jamming like a proficient skill for the wizard and add the proficiency modifier. So in this case, two. But you roll a d20, and add the proficiency modifier, then divide by five, rounded down. And that is the number of additional movements you get added to the SR. So, for example, as a level two wizard with a minor spell jamming helm, you would have a base of three. You roll a d20. If you roll a four as a d20, you get a plus two for proficiency, which is six. Divided by 5 rounded down is 1, so your SR is going to be 4. The other piece that's important to movement is maneuverability class. This piece is direct from the original Spelljammer, and you have maneuverability classes of A through G. G is basically like a comet floating through space or a ship that can't turn at all. So it's just going in a straight line, you can't turn at all. With maneuverability class of F, you can move your number of spaces and then you get your one turn uh, at the end of the movement. Now, when I say turn, it's one hex face, which is 60 degrees. Uh, we actually don't use a hex map. We play on an open space like you do with Star Wars Armada. And we have a 30, 60, 90 triangle. You can also use a protractor. And we basically just move 60 degrees. So for a maneuverability class of D or E, we have to move before we can turn, but then each turn counts as one movement. So for example, this ship actually does have a maneuverability class of D. So if I have five for my SR for that turn, I move one, that counts as one of the SRs. So now I've got four left, and then I can change direction, hex direction, so that's two move again, that's three, change direction again, that's four, one more movement is five, and then I get a bonus turn uh, at the end of any movement. So both maneuverability class D and E work that way, and in case you're wondering what the difference is, it comes on the bonus to initiative roll and the crash bonus. Other than that, those two maneuverability classes are exactly the same. So for B and C, the big difference is that instead of one hex face, they can change two hex faces for a single SR. So pretending for a moment we had maneuverability class C on the living ship, we have to move first for one SR, but then we can change for a second SR direction two hex faces. So one, two. 
Then for our third SR, we would move again and we could change hex direction by two more hex faces. So three, four, and then we can take our fifth movement or fifth SR movement, five, and then we can change direction at the very end, which also for maneuverability class B and C is two hex faces. So as you can see with an SR of five, I was able to move in a full circle with maneuverability class B or C. Now for maneuverability class A, you can change direction up to three places, but you have to move once, but it does not cost SR at all. So for example, for maneuverability class A, if I had an SR of five, I can move one, change direction three hex faces, but it wouldn't cost me a, but it wouldn't cost me an SR. So I've only used up one SR so far and I've already changed directions completely 180 degrees. And then I can go two and then change directions right back to where I started. And I've only used up two SR and then three, four, five, free movement at the end, change direction three places, go 180 again. So as you can see, maneuverability class A is obviously very maneuverable, but it's limited to like a lot of scout type ships, uh, maybe some of the insect oriented ships that can change direction at, at will. Just to put things in perspective, there is nothing in the Astral Adventures Guide that is maneuverability class A. Anything that is A did come in the original Spelljammer. So now that you understand movement maneuverability class, the only thing that's really left is firing of weapons from the ship. So in our games, uh, we have four of us playing, and kind of the way we handle it is we have the captain who does have magic and does power our Spelljamming helm, she decides all of the actual movement. Then we have three separate weapons aboard the ship. We have one in the back, uh, one on the starboard, and one on the port side, so left and right, and one of us mans each of the three weapons. In our case, all three of the weapons are medium ballistas, which have a rate of fire of two and range of four. What that means is if I fire on turn one, I can't fire again until turn three. So each turn, the captain is rolling a dice using a spell jamming skill with her proficiency bonus, and then determining the SR, making the appropriate movement, and then depending on what we're fighting against, if another ship is in range that we're trying to fire at, if it makes sense, we just kind of decide if it makes sense, like coming out of the left side, the person who's manning the left would roll an attack dice because I'm within range of four and try and hit. But then during the next movement, hopefully the captain would maneuver things such that the person in the back, in our case, little Fox would be firing off the back of the ship and we'd be able to get another hit because during turn number two, if I've fired here on turn number one, during turn number two, I would have to take a reload action and wouldn't be able to fire again until turn number three. So in essence, each turn you have an SR and then you have an overall maneuverability rating. The SR determines your total movement. The maneuverability class basically determines how that movement can happen. Additionally, you have various weapons that are aboard the ship that have different ranges and rates of fire and people can man those and take turns accordingly. So we're gonna run through an Excel sheet I created and show the different ships as well as different stats and how they affect the overall movement, combat, and game of Spelljammer. So looking at this Excel, we've got a few tables up top, which I'll jump into in a moment, but we've got the ship section underneath. This top section has all of the ships from the Astral Adventures Guide in order for easy reference. Looking through each of these columns, we can go through and take a look at an armor class, which for the most part is derived from the original Spelljammer. Next we have max speed, which is the only attribute derived from the new Spelljammer set. Then we have maneuverability class, which I went over. There's also a table above that kind of goes through what I just explained. So hex phase, change, uh, SR cost, and then how many hexes you can change, the different maneuverability classes. There's also information about the speed changes. 
that are allowed and the initiative modifiers as well as crash saving modifiers. As stated previously, all except for maneuver maneuverability class G can change one hex face at the end of a turn after moving. On a critical fail, this is kind of something that we came up with, but on a critical fail, auto change direction one hex face. So basically, you get to change hex direction one hex face, but you still move forward at your base speed. And where this comes in, in handy is if I'm trying to move towards a Shrike ship, but I roll a one, instead I change direction one hex face and then move forward three. The next column we have is the minimum crew number. So this is the minimum crew to man the ship. Uh, unfortunately, in the new book, they just kind of give a, an average crew or something to that effect. But we have minimum crew to man the ship and maximum crew allowed. If you exceed the maximum crew, you actually deplete air faster. So you don't want to go above that for that reason. If you do, you just can't travel as long. For minimum crew, if you drop below minimum crew, it's as if you lose a maneuverability class of one. So if you drop below half of your crew, you lose a maneuverability class of two. If you drop below one fourth of your minimum crew, you lose three maneuverability class. And if you drop below one eighth, you essentially drop to a maneuverability class of G. That is from the original Spelljammer book. Uh, it does make perfect sense. It's just like a galleon at sea. You can't have one person sail the whole ship. The next item is hull points, which are different from hit points, and this is what is used for the spell jamming vehicles. Uh, this was changed in the new edition. We don't like it. We don't use it. Uh, you have a number of hull points. The weapons from the original spell jammer that I have up here in a table, the weapons list, outline what kind of damage is done, rate of fire, number of crew needed to man the particular weapon, and then when you crit. So for example, I think I misspoke earlier, what we actually have aboard our ship is three medium catapults. So the range is still four. The hull damage is two to four. So that basically means that the ship is gonna take two damage and then we roll two at random. You can use a 1d6, one through three is a miss, four through six is a hit. We actually use blue Star Wars Armada dice, which 50% hit chance. Um, the next item over here is the crew needed to man the particular weapon. So ours is three, and then rate of fire again every two turns. Critical hit, so in the case of these medium catapults, you crit on a 19 or 20, which is nice, and we'll go over what critting does here in a moment. Uh, the cost to add a new weapon in, this was actually converted, um, and then how much cargo room that it takes up. Jumping back down to the actual uh, ships again, you have your number of hull points. So the living ship, this was the only one that I kind of had to tweak. All of the others come from the original game. Uh, so we have 20 hull points on the living ship. So then we have tons, which is the weight of the ship. Then we have tons worth of cargo. So as I mentioned earlier with the weapons, each of those weapons takes up some amount of cargo. In our case, the medium catapults each take up two tons worth of cargo. So that eats into six of our 10 tons of cargo just for the weapons. Plus we have the uh, ammunition for the weapons on board as well, which takes up another ton for us, I believe. Next, what standard armament. So this is more just a reference for when you run into something in space, what it will most likely have. Then you have the keel length, the beam length, and the type of helm that it is usually inside of it. In this case, minor or major is what the lowercase m, big, case, big m stand for. Uh, next, who built it, who primarily uses it, and then whether or not it can land in water or la on land. So just looking at this, for example, landing the living ship, it does not land on land. You can land it in a planet on water. Looking at the Shrike ship, uh, this is a good example to look at because it lands just fine on land. And then 50% of the time you can make a successful land in water. So in that case, you would roll a percentile die or even a 1d6 like I just mentioned before. And that would determine whether or not it was a su successful landing or a crash landing. Another item we have uh, on this spreadsheet are some of the rams. If you look at a ship like the squid ship, you have a piercing ram mounted on the front. So it auto grapples and also gives damage. Damage on a ram when a ship rams one, one of the other ships 
is straight, it's equal to one hull point per 10 tons of the ship doing the ramming. So in the case of the squid ship, the squid ship is equal to 45 tons. So if you rammed, you would get somewhere between four and five. We would probably just go ahead and do four damage. Maybe we would roll a D6 to determine if that fifth one is applicable or not. Another item on the spreadsheet that I put in there is the crew proficiency. So when calculating SR, uh, this next part is completely optional. When I just went through the example, I assumed like a just normally trained spell dreaming crew. What you can do is provide modifiers based on the crew. So in the case of a green, completely new to space crew, you get a minus two. In the case of just a somewhat, you know, new but it's somewhat experienced crew, you get a minus one. Trained standard crew is zero. Seasoned crew is plus one. And then a crack crew, like top-notch spell jamming crew, is a plus two to that SR rating. So in that case, the, com the calculation would be uh, one for a minor spell jamming helm, plus two for the proficiency for three. If you had a brand new crew that was green, it would be minus two, so you'd be back down to one. And then you would roll your D20. Another thing that we do is on a crit, you get an automatic plus 10 to the roll. So in that case, instead of getting four points, you would actually get six. A few other things I'll point out on this spreadsheet. Uh, if you scroll down to the second group of spell jammers, uh, spell jamming vessels, I have those included in the original spell jamming book that are not in the new set uh, and gave the stats on those just in case anybody's got some older models or something or wants to use those. Um, one thing to note is essentially, and I've got it in both places, but the Star Moth is the Man of War. It is the same ship, it's just got a different name. I listed down here as well the new skill proficiencies that we use when playing, and then the SR calculation as well as down here. Uh, so hopefully you find these tables useful and these different vehicles. Let me know if you have any questions as to how combat works or what to do in various situations.